Dane Killage, dear friends, in opening this interview, I would like to congratulate Dane and Professor Killage on his leadership of Bache Shahir Medical College. I have known Dane Killage for many years and regard him as an outstanding and world-class physician and surgeon. He is an academic leader in the world of neurosurgery. I am proud that he and the faculty of Bache Shahir University would add the name of Roten to this laboratory that will improve surgical training in Turkey and around the world. I have developed great respect for Turkish neurosurgery. The work with young Turkish neurosurgeons has been a most rewarding part of my life. Turkey has given some great late neurosurgery, some great leaders, and some of the world's best neurosurgeons. I am honored and happy to be able to participate in this ceremony and answer your questions. Dr. Khan Yamerlo, an outstanding young neurosurgeon from Istanbul, is serving as my moderator today and it will ask the questions for this interview. First of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Rotten, for your time in answering questions. Can you tell us about your earlier life and how you decided to study medicine? My parents were poor at the time I was born. We lived in a log cabin without plumbing or electricity. Water was from a nearby spring. I attended a two-room schoolhouse in Appalachia, one of the poorest parts of the United States. When I entered college, my father had become a chemist, and I wanted to also be a chemist. I had to work to support myself in college. My part-time work as a college student was with underprivileged and disadvantaged children. I enjoyed that work so much that I decided to become a social worker with poor children. In my last semester of undergraduate social work, I was required to take a course in physiologic psychology. That course was the first time I had began to learn about the brain. I was so excited by the brain that I made the decision by the end of that course to become a neurosurgeon. That course and a great teacher changed the course of my life. I completed my degree in social work and then began the pre-med curriculum. Um, Professor Yamerlo will ask the next question. Thank you, Professor Orton. Who were your mentors and what are the most important lessons you learned from them? The professor in physiologic psychology at the Ohio State University changed my life. I was one of hundreds of students in the class. The professor did not know me or the change he had made in my life. Years later, I returned to that university as a visiting faculty member in neurosurgery and went to find that psychology professor to let him know how important his teaching had been in planning my life. I found that he had died. I believe that most professors and teachers do not realize how important they are in shaping the lives of their students. Khan? How was your education and did you find some aspect of it more beneficial than others? I found the pre-medical courses very difficult and realized early that I could not continue to work part-time uh, as a student as I had done earlier in my uh, courses. Uh, I realized that I would have to stop part-time work uh, because of the difficulty of the pre-medical courses. I had a friend who had saved a thousand dollars and 25 cent coins who lent me his coins to live on 
during the year that I was taking pre-medical courses, I would admitted I was admitted to Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. They had a wonderful neuroscience program. The neurosurgery residency program had trained more neurosurgery chairmen than any other program in the United States at that time. I began to work in the neurosurgery laboratory after entering medical school. There was a strong commitment to academic medicine that reinforced my desire to be an academic neurosurgeon. My neurosurgery chairman instilled in me the importance of good research and providing a high quality of patient care. Upon completing my residency at Washington University, I took a fellowship in neuroanatomy and it was there in the laboratory that I first used a surgical microscope. The microscope had not been introduced to clinical neurosurgery at that time. The views of the brain and nerves under the microscope were better than anything I had seen during my training. I decided that clinical microneurosurgical anatomy would be the focus of my career because it made my patient's surgery more accurate, gentle, precise, and safe. After completing my residency, I was invited to join the staff of the Mayo Clinic where I did surgery and guided the fellows in their research projects. In 1972, I became chairman of neurosurgery at the University of Florida where we built a brain institute and a lab where we could continue to train neurosurgeons in microsurgical and endoscopic anatomy. Khan? What inspired you to write a definitive book on neuroanatomy? I began to study microsurgical anatomy to improve my patient's surgery and not to write or teach. I later found that other neurosurgeons wanted to come to my lab to study with me. Nearly 50 years ago, I began to write papers for the neurosurgical journals and train fellows in the lab. During the early years, our, patient, our papers were the only ones in the neurosurgical journals that focused on microsurgical anatomy. But years later, after writing many papers, several journals came to me and asked me to write a whole issue of the journal on microsurgical anatomy. I accepted that offer from Dr. Mike Capuzzo, the editor of Neurosurgery, and prepared the millennium issue of that journal on the surgery of the posterior fossa. Later, Dr. Apuzo asked me to write the 25th anniversary issue on the supratentorial area. After writing these two issues of the journal from cover to cover, we added additional material and put this together in a book, Cranial Anatomy and Surgical Approaches. That book has become one of the most widely used textbooks in the history of neurosurgery. What are the stories behind the many surgical instruments you designed? In 1973 at the University of Florida, I began to offer courses in microsurgical anatomy. At that time, both in the operating room and at the courses, we did not have the precise instruments to take advantage of the skill that had been acquired in studying microsurgical anatomy. I began to invite all of the instrument companies to the courses and explain to them the instruments that we needed. The companies began to offer us instruments based on those discussions and that we found, we found that many of the instruments greatly improved our surgery. The instruments that we developed included microsurgical dissectors, 
transphenoidal instruments, bipolar coagulation forceps, suction tubes, self-retaining retractors, and others. Eventually, some of the manufacturers began to call them Roten instruments. Years after introdu introducing the instruments, I was visiting a friend at the Cleveland Clinic and watching his surgery. As my friend did surgery, he asked his circulating nurse to bring the rotten dissectors to the operating table and he started to use them. I was in mask and gown in the operating room and I asked the circulating nurse, who did not know me, what she knew about rotten dissectors. And she rapidly replied, they're made of a special alloy of steel called roton. It has been heartwarming to, heartwarming to see these instruments gain wide usage. Uh, Khan? Professor Rodan, how do you manage to balance your work and personal life? Both family and neurosurgery have been very important to me. My wife and I have been married 57 years. We have four children, 12 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. All of our children are pursuing careers in medical-related fields. Three are physicians and one is a nurse. One child is a neurosurgeon. I have always tried to arrive home to see all of the children before they went to bed and to have dinner with them whenever possible. The children knew that I loved my work as a neurosurgeon and my wife was support, very supportive of my career in medicine. I am pleased that all of our children are proud and happy to be in medical careers. Medicine is a wonderful way to serve humanity. What advice would you give to young doctors, neurosurgeons, and scientists? Neurosurgery and medicine has been a wonderful career for me. Neurosurgery has more than met my greatest expectations for my life's work. I have loved caring for my patients and have enjoyed teaching. I found even in medical school that teaching was one of the best ways to learn. My classmates in medical school selected me as the fellow student to whom they most often went for instruction when they did not understand a difficult topic. I was pleased to be asked to help them because I found that teaching was one of the best ways to learn. I feel fortunate to be able to continue my work each day with young neurosurgeons uh, from all over the world uh, in our microsurgical laboratory. We currently have several outstanding young neurosurgeons from Turkey working in the lab. Over the years, we have had more than 100 fellows who studied neuro microsurgical and endoscopic anatomy in our laboratory. They have taught me a great deal. Please always study hard and do the best you can for your patients and students. Always continue to grow in two traits. One is competence, which is skill and knowledge, and the other is compassion, which is love and kindness. The great physician, great neurosurgeon, great scientist, and others in the healthcare team need to grow in both competence and compassion throughout their career. Growth in competence, skill and knowledge is an important lifelong goal of being a physician, surgeon, and scientist. Growing in compassion, love and kindness is important because it provides the inspiration and motivation for constantly improving our patient care and surgery. It's important that we always make good decisions 
for our patients and our trainees. Khan? What advice would you give experienced doctors and scientists? We should always continue to grow in competence, skill and knowledge, and at the same time, grow in compassion, love and kindness, which motivates to do a better, more skillful job for our patients. What do you think the future holds for surgery and medicine? Modern science and our desire to do a better job for our patients have led to many improvements in neurosurgery. I continue to be motivated by the thought that the brain is the crown jewel of creation and evolution. It is our greatest unexplored scientific frontier. The brain is a source of mystery and wonder and the most frequent side of crippling, incurable disease. Modern science has given us so many wonderful tools for improving neurosurgery. I view the future as much more exciting and rewarding than the past. We have wonderful technologies to use for diagnosis and many new treatments that were not available when I started neurosurgery. Neurosurgery is continually improving, but the goal of caring for our patients is one in which there is no finish line. We can always improve. The future ahead is tremendously exciting. It will open many possibilities for improving neurosurgery and making the lives of our patients better. In closing, I would like to congratulate Professor Killich uh, and his leadership of Bache Sahir Medical College and his many contributions to the world of neurosurgery. Thank you.